Hey everyone, welcome to the Endorse Your Right podcast for the week ending March 22nd. Um, my name is Ian. It's good to be back here with you, Will. Yep. Yeah, good. Good. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, been a few weeks, but thank you for having me back on. You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, when the market's happy having me back on, right? So that's a, Yeah, the market a, loves you, man. There we go. That's, um, so coming back into some positive reaction from some of the Fed conversation yesterday, which we'll get into more in just a sec. But I mean, there's been a lot of stuff to talk about across markets over the course of the past couple of weeks. Um, maybe not as much as there has been over the prior couple of years, but feel like there's been some pretty interesting um, interesting conversations we've been having like internally. And so one of the things that we thought would be fruitful for the podcast conversation was to talk about some of the stuff we're writing about in the research um, in more conversational form. Yeah. Um, Cause there's some interesting stuff in our reports over the past week or so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to run through over the next 13 to 15 minutes or so, some pieces that we thought were most notable over the past week. I think we should start with a piece Jamie put in prospecting last week about, 15 years from the great financial crisis. Yeah. That was earlier this week. I think the anniversary was like, it was two like, weeks ago. yeah, two weeks ago, yeah, March 6th, right? Yeah. March 6th, 2009. Right. Six, was six, the bottom. Six. Yikes. March 6th, six, six, six. Yeah. 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 So March <laughs> 6th, 2009 was the bottom. And this was more of a call it qualitative piece, but just like the importance of having a process and staying disciplined because getting out to one thing, getting back in is sometimes much harder. So you've seen people for the past 15 years, and rightfully so, be timid to get back into the market. Each 5 to 10% pullback could it be in another, you know, crisis and 30% drawdown. Yeah. And I think that that piece kind of helps provide some perspective because it brings up a quote from a certain financial pundit that was on a certain TV show back in 2008, not going to name any names, um, but is is the, the individual said, whatever money you may need for the next five years, take it out of the stock market right now. Oh, yeah. That call, good for them. Right. So it was 25 percent downside in equities further from that point. Um, but after you, it, it, from a, a behavioral perspective, you take that money out. It's really hard to put that money back in. Yeah. Right. And so that's just looking at it. Hey, let's just move it from stocks to bonds moving forward. Right. I mean, nothing is going to even get close to the performance of what you would have done if you just left it in and let it ride. Yeah. Over that time frame. Right. Yeah. I mean, even if you bought the actual top in October 2007, from that point forward, to today, Nasdaq composites up four hundred and ninety percent. The S and P uh, S and P is up two hundred and forty. So again, there's a lot of benefit of hindsight. There's no way that somebody bought the top and they would have felt comfortable riding that thing all all, all the way down to March of nine. Right, right. But it speaks to the importance of having a process of not only getting out but also getting back in. Right, and I think that helps just provide some perspective for the hey, there, the the uh, even if you're perfect market timing, I mean, it's not like obviously impossible to do, but without doing that, I mean, having that process is more important over the long run. Yeah. All right. I think next point that we should probably hit, hit on more relevant to the time of this week is some of the inflation data that was been trickling through some of the commentary we saw yesterday from the Fed. And we put some kind of several different pieces in our report over the past couple of weeks. We'll give you the cliff notes here. But Joseph and I were kind of riffing on this whole idea of commodities have been breaking out. You can look at copper, gold, obviously has been in headlines, crude, crude oil. Yeah, yeah, crude oil has been coming around. Even silver is pretty close to breaking yeah. out in big yeah. area. Yeah. Cocoa has been going gangbusters for a long time. Right. So you're seeing commodities break out of this these big areas of resistance. And there's, I think, some some quiet expectations that may, maybe that trickles through to inflation, keeps it higher for longer, and then maybe forces the Fed to keep rates higher, higher for longer too. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it's, it's a, when you think about it and put it from that broader perspective, it makes sense. Right. I mean, you know, like these are the things that are contributing majorly to inflation. Right. I mean, and so seeing that move higher, you would naturally see inflation would move higher as well, but you had a pretty interesting chart looking at in the report. When was it? It was just yesterday. Right. Yeah. Um, in our, the old piece yesterday, looking at the comparison between CPI and our, and the, our continuous commodity index, which just for those that the continuous commodity index, I believe it's just an equal weighted equal basket, weight, yeah. right? Of of major commodity futures yeah. contracts. Yeah, it's it's not production weighted like a, a lot of the main commodity in, indices or funds would be. Right. And so it's just looking at you you don't they're not a one for one. They don't follow each other all the time, but you tend to see kind of major like thematical shifts in, in, in tail each other. Yeah. Specifically CPI tails commodities. That's what it seems to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we did see that continuous commodity index, that equal weight basket of commodities. We saw that perk up recently in terms of positive price action. Haven't seen CPI really turn around 
just yet. Right. It's been flat. And and we know the the Fed says they're more interested in PCE, so not, not, not so much CPI, but kind of made the point that CPI still affects investor sentiment and in, investor behavior. That's going to be a headline that people will probably react to, whether retail or institutional. So that's, I think, something to keep on the radar that there is a possibility that if we get enough follow through, then maybe it's a bit stickier. Right. And I mean, when you're looking at stuff like even the, um, that was the just, that wasn't core CPI that you were looking at, right? That no, was, no, that was just straight up. So yeah. when you're saying that's going to include stuff like oil, it's a major yeah. component of that. You see crude oil, like CO4 slash on our site, just moved back, back to a positive trend or consecutive buy signals now, not overbought. I mean, you just look objectively at that yeah. crude chart. That's it's a pretty good, good looking chart. Consistently higher lows. Um, maybe not great for CPI, but it could look in chart number one. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's riding some seasonal tailwinds yeah, right now, for sure, for which sure. w- which makes sense. Some something related that I wanted to bring up. Jamie put this in the fixed income note yesterday, just talking about the FOMC members and their kind of projections for rates over the coming year. It, it, it's funny to me because it's almost like we're getting good news in the market now, taking it as good news so it's like oh, oh good news is good news now yeah we, 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 keep, we keep going back and forth but i and i was making this point on a morning video like what's the what alternative do you want like what option do you want do you want the market do we want rate cuts to be coming because the economy needs stimulation and companies as a result would need stimulation or would you rather the case be that oh, inflation's higher than they wanted because demand's there and consumers are still spending money in a healthy way right i know there's a big assumption and jumps there but i rather take the latter yeah and there's some interest i mean you can blow that out and do it a million different ways right to kind of look at it from a forward perspective but i mean from looking at the the forward expectations it, it was unchanged from a year out but then you look out over two years and three years yeah. out you, you see that tick up a little bit yeah so, so rate the expectations, expectations higher. From, from a more longer term time horizon are going to be long, like higher for longer which what have they been saying yeah higher for longer and so it needs to be kind of interesting to see how that plays out. Like Jim is talking this morning. I mean, obviously the market movement over the past like day, rolling day, basically, mm-hmm. has just seen a couple rate a couple rate cuts this year. Good for markets, right? In the <laughs> near term, which I mean is probably a, a, a good thing. But that does bring in an inter- interesting question from a longer term perspective. We do get rate cuts are going to be for a reason, yeah. And so that that's a bigger kind of question or concern. I think that. that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. if you're getting rate cuts, they they are for a reason, right? So yeah, po- pocket that. But as you mentioned just now as well, equities have just been screaming to the upside. I know we've, along with everybody else, has just been waiting for the market to take a breather. And you've seen investor sentiment continue to pick up yeah. sentiment tends to follow price, as we like to mention. We looked at the AAII numbers, talked about those last week. There's another one that's not as popular. It's called the National Association of Active Investment Managers. GASP for the long name. What's the acronym there? Yeah, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) N-A-A-I-M. But it's it's asking their participants, like, what's their average equity exposure? This goes all the way up to 200%, but this went above 100. So that's essentially... You're you're long and you're almost levered long is what their participants were yeah, saying. Exactly. So it's it's pretty euphoric. It's a pretty bullish sentiment reading. And surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly to us, but the market actually did pretty well after you all saw this degree of bullish sentiment on that survey, which coincides with the AAII figures to say that you know these like euphoria, yeah, for the short term. I think some consolidation is still to be expected. I think that'd be prudent. The data would back that up. But longer term markets have still done well. It's the same kind of thing. Good news is good news. I mean, people are bullish. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. more buyers than sellers. Prices are going to go up. Right? Yeah, exactly. So if people are generally more bullish. You're going to see prices continue to move forward, move higher from there. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a, you can kind of see it all kind of playing, playing off one another, but it's good to see that we look at weight of the evidence, right? Weight of the evidence from a lot of different areas are kind of still bullish in the yeah. intermediate term, which I mean, it could be a kind of good, yeah. good side for markets moving forward. And if enough people think the market's going to pull back and come down, then that's good. Right, right. Yeah. If everyone's guessing that we're going to have a, a correction or everyone's calling the next recession, which is not happening as much anymore, and then like, yeah, probably not going to happen. Right. And so yeah. that's, that's kind of. It's always a surprise that gets you. It is. And, but another kind of point from a research pieces that we've uh, been in on. It's not only U.S. markets that have been moving higher. Um, we had a, a bit in the report last Friday that was looking at um, cons- consecutive weekly gaining streaks for the stock 600 index in, in Europe. 
Um, we hit eight weeks last week, which is pretty rare. It's so only eight straight weeks, eight of straight weeks of gains, um, which has only happened on five other occasions. And it's like a broad Europe benchmark. Broad Europe, okay. Like essentially, think top five hundred, like S and P five hundred, but Europe stuff. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you're looking at from end of nineteen ninety nine or from nineteen ninety nine forward, so like twenty five, almost twenty five years of data. It's only happened five other times. Um, interesting times in there. You see like 2005, 2006, during that kind of run of international equities, showing some some pretty strong forward returns from there. Yeah. And really the only down year that you saw moving forward was 2018. We saw that happen from there. It didn't, uh, Europe did not do well after, after that environment. That was kind of the ultimate top. But those, those consecutive winning streaks for European stocks, I mean, it's, it's something we've seen not just on the domestic side, seeing that play out internationally as well. And meanwhile, you're getting into some other areas, had some a bit in the international piece yesterday on Wednesday, looking at some like negative news headlines around like European luxury goods, like LVMH specifically, the ADR here, LVMUY. We had some some headlines coming out from Gucci saying they projected declining sales due to China concerns. And that tanked LVMH for that day. But like you look at the chart, that tank really was just a pullback from all time highs. It looked good. And yeah. It already reversed up with movement on Wednesday. So I think there's some opportunity, pretty interesting opportunities that could be had out there outside of just the US too. Cool. Um, what was some of this movement we've seen over the past couple of weeks? Yeah, that's good. It gives people options. You don't have to get forced into cap weight S P five hundred when a, a lot of things are doing well. It helps diversification. Even yields being higher helps diversification for the long term because you can get income. You're yeah. forced into equities. Yeah. yeah. Ian, uh, parting shot here. Chipotle. When's the last time you went to Chipotle? And how was your I- I- experience? I went Monday. Oh, it okay. Was, it, was, it was actually it was actually a very good experience, which I feel like is about a 50-50 shot when I go to Chipotle. It is polarizing. It is. I ask people and they're like, oh, I went to this place, this Chipotle, horrible. I went to the one down, down the street, great. But then the next time you go, it'll be flipped. So, I mean, it's a 50-50 shot. I think that Chipotle took that 50-50 shot and they just projected <laughs> that into their, into their stock split coming up, right? Do you like think of these transitions in the evening or something? No, no, yeah, no it's good. It's just, just so, so what Ian's <laughs> getting at is is the, the Chipotle board, they approved a 50 for one Stock split. That's a big stock. I mean, split. fifty for one. It's, it's a almost a three thousand dollars stock. Three thousand three thousand dollars stock. Yeah, the stock bounced on the news. I think it was up eight percent intraday. And we we know, I guess, technically, stock splits shouldn't impact supply and demand, but they kind of do. Yeah, historically. And we were talking about it yesterday. And John brought up some good points. John Lewis, our portfolio manager, that's like. You think of a lot of these uh, trading platforms yeah. that they're going to have um, essentially once the stock gets too big, they can't buy it because the account sizes they need are going to be right. at a specific point where hey, all of a sudden if that stock price comes down, then they can buy the stock again. And like institutional money coming into play too. Right. And you just have different players, more players, um, even like sure from a retail side, you would think that, hey, if the stock's $3,000, like I'm probably not going to be going out and buying yeah. that, that particular stock. Yeah. Fractional shares are all a thing now too, so it's not right. much of a not true, much of a true. game. But on the institutional side, there are still limits at different places. They're like, hey, you can't buy the stock that's above that price. That's a good point. Yeah. So equity options too, like no one's going out yeah, for like a yeah. hundred shares of Chipotle. Well, like some I, people buy. Some people buy. <laughs> a lot don't want to pony up. Well, you're right. Shares. No. <laughs> uh, but pretty interesting move. I mean, pretty sharp move higher. Hard to good forever. Yeah. But, yeah. It's good looking stock. If only they're. Uh, their consistency of burritos could keep up with their consistency of improvement. That would be ideal. Boom. In the <laughs> pod there. <laughs> cool. But actually, yeah, that's all, that's all I have. Yeah. No, I think that's all you have too. And for those that don't uh, have access to some of the research too, I mean, we're running through some content. Don't want to get too, like, we'll certainly just want to bring interesting things to people, right? Yeah. So, um, but reach out to us, any thoughts, comments, questions, and concerns. If you want to see us write about something, like if you think something's interesting and you'd like to see kind of what we're, we're looking at, um, always looking for ideas. Yep. Yeah. Give it a shout. DWA at Cool. Thank you. See you guys.